Hello, wonderful algebra students. This lesson is going to be on equations and their graphs. This is going to be going back to some of the stuff we had seen with graphs and equations in pre-algebra. So we're going to be reviewing some of that and then just building on it as we talk about how to graph equations into variables. As our warm up, we're going to do one of these which one doesn't belong activities. We had done a few of these back in unit one on statistics, but as a reminder for these activities, your goal is to make an argument as for why one of these four graphs here doesn't belong. I want to remind you that for these, there is no one correct answer. There is a way for you to argue that each of these graphs is the one that doesn't belong. So the focus isn't on correctly identifying which one doesn't belong. The focus is really on being able to explain and justify why that graph does not belong with the others. Go ahead, pause this video, take a moment here to see if you can pick one of the graphs and how you would argue that it doesn't belong. All right. So earlier when we did this lesson in our Google Meet, someone had chosen A here and said A was the one that didn't belong. And their reasoning, they had started off by saying it starts in the corner of the graph, whereas all these other ones start somewhere else on the y-axis. Uh, we had talked back in, I think back in developmental math even in pre-algebra, what this little point right here is called in the corner. Do you remember? That's called the origin. So for this first one here, you could argue A didn't belong because it starts in the origin, whereas B, C, and D all start somewhere on the y-axis. Uh, the next student said D was the one that didn't belong because they noticed that the line in D is going down, whereas the line in A, B, and C is going up. Uh, we connected that to another vocabulary word. If you're talking about the direction of the line. What is that related to? See if you can remember. It's related to slope. The slope of these first three lines here is positive. I know that because the line's going up. I can't calculate the number for slope because I don't have any numbers on these graphs. But because the lines are going up, I know all of these have a positive slope, but this last one here goes down, so it has a negative slope. Another student said, well, what about graph C? And I said, what about graph C? And they said, I feel like graph C is the one that doesn't belong because it's the only one that's just a series of points instead of a line. So if you picked C, that would be a great way to justify why C is the one that doesn't belong. A, B, and D all are, are a line. <laughs> it's connected points, whereas B is just a series of points or a dotted line. And then for B, I chose B for mine. I said if I'm looking at the X and the Y axis, or those labels, which we know is really important when you're looking at graphs, I noticed that A, C, and D all talked about hours on the X axis and dollars on the Y axis, whereas B is flipped around. It's showing dollars on X and then hours on Y. So that makes B the one that doesn't belong for me. Any of those would be good justifications for this. The purpose of this is just to, like it's, it's called, right? To warm us up, since we're gonna be looking at graphs today, uh, taking you back to what you already know about graphs as we, we work to build on that knowledge. With that, we will move down to the second part, which is an activity called Snacks in Bulk. Uh, for this second part here, we are given this description that says, to get snacks for a class trip, Claire went to the bulk section of the grocery store where she could buy any quantity of a product and the prices are usually good. Claire purchased some salted almonds at $6 a pound and some dried figs at $9 a pound. She spent $75 before tax. I'm gonna have us just focus for now on numbers one and two. In number one, it says, if she bought two pounds of almonds, how many pounds of figs did she buy? And in number two, it says, if she bought one pound of figs, how many pounds of almonds did she buy? Have you go ahead, pause the video, try numbers one and two now. All right. So in order to answer this question, we're going to need to use the information they said above about how almonds are $6 a pound and figs are $9 per pound. Um, both of these are saying essentially each pound costs $6 for almonds and each pound costs $9 for figs. By using that, that unit price there, we can calculate something like the cost of two pounds of almonds. I can take those two pounds of almonds 
and multiply it by the cost, which is $6 for each pound, and we get that's a total of $12 on your almonds. Now we know she spent a total of $75. So if I know there's a total of $75 spent, I can take out the money that was spent on almonds and that's gonna tell me how much money was spent on the fix. If I do 75 minus 12, that leaves me with $63. And that then is gonna be how much money was spent on the fix. So we've got $63 for the figs. The last part of this, well, if we know she spent $63 on figs and figs are $9 per pound, I could take that $63, the, the total amount she spent on figs, divide it by how much money she spends on each pound of figs, and that's gonna tell me that she spent seven, sorry, not she spent, she bought seven pounds of figs. So I can answer my question, how many pounds of figs did she buy that way? Number two is similar, just different information. If you are unable to do number one, I encourage you to pause the video now and try number two. For number two, I'm gonna go through the same steps though. If she bought one pound of figs, I can say, well, she bought one pound of figs and each pound cost $9. So she spent $9 total on figs. She spent a total of $75. So I could subtract out the money she spent on figs. And that leaves me with how much money she spent on the almonds. And then the last part, if she spent a total of $66 on almonds, each pound of almonds cost $6. I can divide that and get, she must have bought 11 pounds of almonds. The next part here, so we've done some math with this information. Let's go ahead and represent it with an equation. So for number three, it says write in an equation that describes the relationship between pounds of figs and pounds of almonds that Claire bought and the dollar amount that she paid. Be sure to specify what variables represent. Go ahead and try to represent this description here with an equation. All right. So in this part here, we are given the information that she's paying $6 for each pound of almonds. So I could start off by representing that as 6A. 6 times A, where A represents the um, total pounds of almonds she purchased. Notice up here when we were doing this math, we were multiplying the $6 times how many pounds of almonds she bought. So that's what this right here in our equation is representing. Uh, she's also buying figs at $9 for each pound. So I could say she is also paying $9 for each pound of figs. And similar to A, I've got F here. F is going to represent the total pounds of figs or how many pounds of figs she bought. Uh, similar to what I did right here, I'm multiplying the amount of, sorry, the amount of pounds of figs she bought times the cost of figs. That's what the 9F there is representing. The last part is we know she spent a total of $75 per before tax. So once I add up the amount of money she spent on the almonds plus the amount of money she spent on the figs, that should equal a total of $75. So we're left with this equation here. You could have written it like this. If you had 75 in the front, that is saying the same thing. If you had instead of 6a plus 9f, you had 9f plus 6a equals 75. All these equations are different ways to represent that same relationship here. Any of these would be correct. The next part, and this is really the, the new part for today, is incorporating graphs into this equation representation. So the next part, I'm going to come down, and we are now given a graph that represents the quantities in this situation. Go ahead, pause the video, look at this graph, see if you can make some observations about the graph. The ones we got earlier in class today is we've got a line here. So they've graphed a line. We've got some points that have been marked that are on the line. We also have points like D and E that have been marked that are not on the line. And we've got that the X and the Y axis are describing those variables we had identified earlier. We've got the pounds of almonds for our X axis. We've got the pounds of figs for our Y axis. 
This observation about some of the points being on the line, some of the points being off the line are also going to be important for these upcoming questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and also copy down some of the information we were given earlier. So we were given that each pound of almonds cost $6, each pound of figs cost $9, and we've got she spent a total of $75. So I'm just going to write down it's $6 per pound of almonds, it's $9 per pound of figs, and she spent, uh, she spent a total of $75. Uh, using this information here and this graph here, uh, we're going to go ahead and choose any point on the line. State its coordinates. Remember, coordinates is that pair of numbers that represents the point. And we're going to explain what it tells us, what information we can learn from that point. Go ahead, pause the video now. Pick one of the points that are on the line. Go ahead, see if you can write the coordinates, and then explain what it tells us. So earlier in class today, they ended up choosing the point C. If you picked A or B, those also are both good. Uh, for C, point C is at the coordinate 6.54. If you're trying to figure out where those numbers came from, that first number is always your X coordinate. So if I take this point down to my X axis, I see that it's between six and seven at 6.5. And if I take it over to my y-axis, that's where that second number comes from, I can see it's at the number 4. Now this is the coordinates, but both of those numbers represent something in this, this context or this situation. That x-coordinate, that 6.5, tells me this point right here is showing 6.5 pounds of almonds. And then the four, you can probably guess that four is representing four pounds of figs, four pounds of dried figs. So this point here represents the combination of buying 6.5 pounds of almonds and four pounds of figs. Now we can go further with this information using this math up here that you guys were doing earlier. We had been given the information that each pound of almonds cost $6, each pound of fig cost $9. We also know she spent a total of $75. Let's do some math. If she bought this combination, what would it cost her? Well, to find how much money she spent on the almonds, we're going to take the pounds, multiply it by how much one pound of almonds costs. So that's $6. And that works out to be $39. You could do the same thing for the figs. So four pounds of figs times the $9 per pound of figs gives us a total of $36. And then for the total amount of money spent, if you take the amount spent on almonds, the amount spent on figs, it works out to be a total of $75, which is, remember what we were told she's spending. She's spending a total of $75. If you picked A or B, remember we could have picked any point on the line. Point A is at the coordinates 2, 7. And if you do that math out, the similar math we did right here, you're going to see that uh, if she were to buy that combination, she also would spend $75. For point C, C has the coordinate 14, 0. And similarly, if you do the math out for that combination of almonds and figs, you also see that she spent $75. I want to pause here, see if you, you notice anything about points A, B, and C. Well, if I'm noticing a trend or a pattern here, I notice A, B, and C. Each time the combination of figs and almonds was different, but all three of them work out to be $75. Let's move on to some points that aren't on the line and see if we notice a pattern there. For points D and E, those points are not on this graphed line. They are not on the line that represents this equation we came up with earlier. Let's go ahead and do similar steps. So let's find the coordinates and then explain what those points tell us. Uh, earlier today, uh, students in our Google Meet picked the point D to look at. So let's look at point D here. For point D, 
for point D, see if you can go ahead and, similar to what we were doing before, uh, go ahead, give us the coordinates, and then explain what point D tells us in this context. Go ahead, pause the video and do that now. Okay. Well, point D has the coordinates 1, 1. Similar to what I was doing before, I'm just looking at where that point, that black point right there, is on our x-axis and our y-axis, which here happens to be 1 on both of those. That represents buying a combination of 1 pound of almonds and 1 pound of figs. When we go to do the math for that, well, 1 pound of almonds times the $6 per pound of almonds means you're spending $6 on almonds. And one pound of figs times the $9 per pound of figs means you're spending $9 on figs. Don't feel like you had to write out that multiplication, but if you did, that's what it would look like. So if you're buying a pound of each, it means you're spending $6 plus $9. So you're spending a total between the almonds and the figs. You're spending a total of my hands catch up here, $15. Anything you notice about that point compared to the first three we looked at? Well, if you're not quite sure, you don't know if, if it's just a lucky coincidence or if it, it's true, let's look at E2. So for point E, E, the coordinates are 14, 0. Oh no! See, this is why I need students to call me out. I wrote, I wrote C up here. My gosh, I'm so sorry, but we're not gonna. B is right here. I'm so sorry, guys. It is 11, one, but I promise you that does work out to be $75. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you were probably so confused earlier. Yes, so A, B, and C are the three points that are on the line. Those are the coordinates. They all work out to be $75. I am so sorry about that. <laughs> so when we come down here, I was like, E, that coordinate looks so familiar. <laughs> e is a point that's not on the line. The coordinates of E are indeed 14, 0. That would represent buying 14 almonds and zero figs, so no figs. Uh, if you buy 14 pounds of almonds, I should put pounds there, that would work out to be 14 pounds times the $6 per pound, which would end up giving you $74? Uh, so pausing here, I'm all flustered because I got that coordinate wrong, I'm so sorry. But pausing here, uh, again, we're going to see if we can make some observations. Uh, looking at points D and E, those were the two points that we noticed are not on the line. Any observations you can make from that? Well, before points A, B, and C, we had noticed all ended up being a total of $75. Points D and E aren't $75, they're other amounts. Um, from that, we can, we can come to a conclusion. Uh, any of these points here are, that are on the line are meeting these constraints here. What that means is any point we pick out on the line, let's say I picked this point right here. I don't need to do the math to figure out how much that costs. Any point on this line here are making these constraints and would be a total of $75. If I pick a point outside the line, like up there, also don't need to do the math, that point there isn't meeting these constraints. It would not be $75. So those points that are on that line are tied to this equation and to this context here. They're satisfying that equation and all the constraints of this problem. I've got some follow-up questions with that. Uh, so for part C, from the graph, it looks like the point 7, 3.5 might be a solution, but it's hard to know for sure. Is there a way to verify? Well, let's find the point 7, 3.5. 7, and then 3.5 is right there. So it looks like it could be 
We're not sure. Well, it, maybe it is. Can you think of what we might do to see if it's a solution? If it is a, a combination she could buy for her $75? Well, remember, we've got this equation from before. We've got the 6a plus 9f equals 75. If I want to see if that point is a solution, meaning if I want to see if that point satisfies all these constraints, I could substitute those numbers. That point right there is telling me 7 pounds of almonds and 3.5 pounds of figs. I could substitute that information into our equation. I could substitute it into that 6a plus 9f equals 75 equation to see if it actually is a, a good combination. Um, one other question for D. We've got, suppose we extend the two ends of the graph beyond the first quadrant. Would a point on those parts of the line, for example, negative 1, 9, be a solution to this equation? Why or why not? So if we were to extend this line past quadrant one, so if this line kept going that way and going that way, would points on either side there be a solution? Why or why not? Well, let's look at this example here, the negative one nine. So for example, would negative one nine be a solution to this equation? Well, I can check by substituting. I could check to see if I substitute negative one in for a and nine in for f, would that actually equal 75? If we do the math, six times negative one is negative six. Nine times nine is 81. And negative six plus 81 is in fact 75. So in terms of it being a solution for this equation, I see it is a solution because it does actually equal 75. However, think about what this point here represents. There's a reason this graph cut off here. That point negative 1, 9 is right up here. What does that point mean in this context? Well, negative 1, 9 is telling us the combination of pounds of almonds and pounds of figs. Negative 1, 9, that, those coordinates mean negative 1 pounds of almonds and 9 pounds of figs. So despite the fact that that point there is actually a solution to the equation, it's not a solution in the context of this problem. It wouldn't make sense to say, oh yeah, she can buy negative one pounds of almonds. If I had just given you this equation and said, is the, the point negative one nine a solution point? Your answer would be yes. But because we're given this context of pounds of almonds and pounds of figs, this one here wouldn't be a solution because it doesn't make sense in the constraints of this problem. Going to move us on to the last part of this lesson, which is going to be this activity here. We've got in number one, a student has a savings account with $475 in it. She deposits $125 of her paycheck into the account every week. Her goal is to save $7,000 for college. I'm going to have you start by focusing in on parts A and B. Part A says how much will be in the account after three weeks. Part B says, how long will it take before she has $1,350? Go ahead, try those two parts now. Alrighty. So in this situation here, we are told that she's starting off with $475, and then she's depositing or adding $125 into her account each week. If I'm trying to figure out how much money is in the account after three weeks, well, if she's deposited $125 each week for three weeks, I would want to start off by multiplying the $125 by the three weeks. And that gives me she's deposited a total of $375 after the three weeks. However, we can't forget that starting amount there. It started off with $475. So when we add in that money she was starting with, we end up with 
$850 is in the account. The $475 was there from the beginning, and then she's deposited the $375 over the span of those three weeks. For part B, it's, it's like the question's backwards. We've got how long will it take before she has $1,350? Well, if I'm trying to find how long, I'm trying to find how many weeks it's been, I want to start off, if this is that total amount of money, I need to take out that starting amount. So I can take my $1,350, subtract out the money she started within the account, and that is going to end up giving me $875. And then the last part here, that's how much money she has deposited into her account. If I want to find how many weeks she's been depositing, I want to take that amount and divide it by our 125, which leaves me with seven or seven weeks. She's been depositing money for seven weeks to get $875 saved up. And then after that, uh, with that starting amount there, she ended up having $1,350. So we've done some calculations with this information. Next up, similar to before, is let's write an equation that represents this relationship. So given all this information here, can you write an equation that represents the scenario? Okay. Well, our equation, I know she's starting off with $475, and then she's depositing or adding $125 each week. Because she's depositing the $125 every single week, notice up here we multiplied that 125 times the number of weeks. In this case, it was three. So in my equation, it would say 125W, where W represents how many weeks have gone by. To make this an equation, I need it to equal something. Her goal, remember, is she's trying to save $7,000. So I'm going to say, let's make that equal $7,000. She's starting with $475. She's adding $125 each week to her account. And the end goal is to have that total of $7,000. In that equation, I used a variable W. I can just say that W represents the number of weeks she's deposited money in her account. Something along those lines there. Now for this next part, we are going to graph this equation using an online graphing calculator. So I'm going to kind of split my screen here so we can see the questions and the graph at the same time. We had our equation right here. Instead of W, I'm going to use X just since we're talking about this graph here got 475 plus 125x. And there we go. We've got our equation graphed here. This is similar to up here, except instead of them giving us the graph, we had to come up with it on our own. When I come down here, it says graph for your equation using the graphing technology. Let's find these points we had talked about earlier. So earlier we had talked about how at three weeks she would have $850. Let's find where that is on this graph here. I can move that over. What well, three weeks, I want to come down to our x-axis, which is talking about weeks. I'm going to go over one, two, three. Here's three weeks. And $850. Let's see. If I go up, this is 500. This is 1,000, which means each one of these lines here represents 100. So I'm going up 500, 600, 700, 800, and 850 would be halfway up. So notice that point is right there. What about the other thing we found? We found that after seven weeks, she would have $1,350. $1,350? Well, here's 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, and 350 would be like halfway in between here. If I go over, it's right here on my line. And if I come down, I'm seeing that's at seven weeks, like we found. So one of the benefits of this graph, do you see what it is? Well, it's telling me all these things that we calculated earlier doing math. 
instead of needing to do the math to see how much she would have saved after three weeks or at what week she would have this much money, you can use this line here to help you find those points. So a quick check then. If I wanted to use this graph to answer this question, how could I? The question is, how long will it take her to reach her goal? If you remember from earlier, her goal is to save $7,000 for college. How could I use this graph to help me figure out how long it would take for her to get to that goal of $7,000? Well, if I find $7,000 on this line, it's going to show me how many weeks it would take for her to get there. Now notice I'm only up here to $1,500, so I'm going to have to back up to find that 7,000. 7,000 is going to be between the six and the 8,000. So it's right here. And then if I go over to the line, we get that it's crossing right there. And I can see, there it is. Oh, there it is. At 7,000, it's 52.2 weeks. Uh, so by 52 weeks, she's not quite there yet, but by 53 weeks, she would be. So we can use this graph right here, again, to find how many total weeks. If I go down from that, that point there at 7,000, that's how I'm getting that, around like 52, 53 weeks. So coming back to this, I'm going to jump us down here for the, the cool down. This will be like a good check to see like where you're at with this lesson. Uh, go ahead and read through the description here and answer questions number one and number two. For this cool down activity, we've got a ceramic sugar bowl weighs 340 grams when empty. It is then filled with sugar. One tablespoon of sugar weighs 12.5 grams. If I wanted to write an equation to represent this, we're writing an equation for the total weight. So my equation would start W equals or the weight equals. Well, the weight's starting at 340 grams when empty. And then we're adding tablespoons of sugar. Each tablespoon is going to weigh seven, where am I getting seven? 12.5 grams. We got 12.5 grams, but that's for every single tablespoon of sugar. So I would want to multiply that by how many tablespoons of sugar to get the total weight of the sugar. And then I'm still adding in that empty bowl there to get our overall total weight. So we've got an equation like this. Um, you could have written it like this. You could have had 12.5 T plus the 340 equals the weight. The order of those aren't important as long as you've got, you're adding the weight of the sugar, uh, sorry, the weight of the tablespoons of sugar with the weight of the bowl equaling your total weight there. For number two, it tells us when the sugar bowl is full, it weighs 740 grams. How many tablespoons of sugar can the bowl hold? Show your reasoning. Here, they're giving us that total weight, the 740 grams. So using that equation from earlier, I can say, well, that total weight then, instead of using W, I can say that total weight is 740. And that equals 340 plus 12.5 T. If I'm trying to figure out how many tablespoons of sugar the bowl, the bowl can hold, I just need to solve this equation for T. In order to solve it, I want to start off by subtracting out the weight of that empty bowl. I want to start by subtracting our constant, which is the 340. So I'm going to come in and subtract 340 on both sides. If I do that, it leaves me with 400 equals 12.5 T. My last part, if I'm trying to find how many tablespoons I'm trying to solve for T, that means I need to get rid of that 12.5. I need to divide by 12.5. So we can say 400 divided by our 12.5. That's going to tell me how many tablespoons. When you do that division, you get 32 equals T, which would mean 30, oops, which would mean the bowl can hold 32 
tablespoons of sugar. If you wanted to confirm that, that we actually, you know, did all this math correctly and that that sugar bowl when full can hold 32 tablespoons, do you know what math you could do here? Well, it's kind of similar to the math we were doing earlier. You could check by actually finding out the total weight with 32 tablespoons. If we were to take our 32 tablespoons and multiply by the weight of each tablespoon, which is the 12.5 grams, when you multiply that out, you get 400 grams. So we figured out 32 tablespoons of sugar weigh 400 grams. But then when you add in that bowl itself, the 340, that ends up giving you a total of 740 grams, which is what it told us that full sugar bowl would weigh. For number three, time to bring in the graph now. We've got the graph represents the relationship between the number of tablespoons of sugar in the bowl and the total weight of the bowl. So this right here is a graph of this equation we've written earlier. Uh, and it's telling us that the shows the relationship between the number of tablespoons of sugar in the bowl, which is down here for our x-axis, and then the total weight of the bowl, which is over here on our y-axis. Which point on the graph could represent our answer to this previous question up here? We're trying to figure out earlier when the bowl is full, it weighs 740 grams. How many tablespoons of sugar that is that? If I find on our graph where 740 is, 740 is about here. If I go across, I see point D represents that full bowl of sugar. If I come down, I see it's matching up with that math we did and showing that there's 32 tablespoons of sugar in it. You could also use this graph instead of calculations to answer a question like this about how many tablespoons of sugar are in the bowl when the total weight is 600 grams. How could I use the graph to help me figure out that? Well, if the total weight is 600 grams, I could come over and see that 600 grams, that's a little bit more than, ooh, my lines are crooked, a little bit more than 20 tablespoons of sugar, so maybe like 21. If it's something like that where the, it's not intersecting at like a super clear point, so at the intersection of those grid lines, it's helpful to, to do the math to confirm. So we think it's around 21 maybe. We could always go in and do the math, similar to what we did here. Instead of that total being 740 though, it would be 600 and use that to calculate that exact amount. This is going to be the stopping point for this lesson. Uh, we will continue working on equations in tomorrow's lesson. Hopefully you found this helpful. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.